with the Gig Harbor City. Oh, sorry, Josh. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I'd like to call to order the Gig Harbor City Council special meeting of Tuesday, January 10th, 2023. The time is 1.01 p.m. I will do a roll call from my far left. Council Member Wook? Here. Council Member Storset? Here. Council Member Rodenberg? Here. Council Member Likens? Here. Council Member Henderson? Here. And Council Member Barber? Here. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to turn it right over to our city clerk, Josh Stecker, to explain the interview process overview to us and welcome candidates and family members and friends, members of the public. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for those watching online as well. Thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, Council, and welcome to our candidates. Um, I'm just going to fairly quickly run through the process. Um, our candidates, I've sent them all an email and let them know how this works, and I think Council is pretty familiar with it too, but just to go over it again for everyone, um, and if there's any questions, I can try to clarify those before we get started. But um, So the, the steps for this, this process, the first step is going to be each of the applicants, and we have seven of them here today, uh, will be given three minutes to address Council from the podium um, on their qualifications and their reason for seeking appointment to the City Council. Um, so we have a timer that will be on the podium. Um, it's set for three minutes. Uh, it'll turn red when their time is up. Um, it's just to give everybody a heads up on when that's happening. Um, after we do the introductory statements, uh, council will be asked, each council member will be asked to choose four candidates that they would like to see move forward to the interview process. Um, those, the uh, selection of those four candidates will be made by each council member each council member will write their own name at the top of a piece of paper, followed by the four people that they would like to interview. Um, we'll collect all of those written votes and tally them up. And the four candidates that uh, receive the most votes will move forward to the in the interview process. Um, if there's an instance of a tie, then we'll ask council to uh, vote on the two people that are tied to see uh, who moves forward in that process. Um, once we have determined the four people, we'll uh, move the podium out of the way and bring in a couple of tables. All four candidates will sit at the tables together. Uh, we have a list of nine questions that the mayor and council are gonna ask of each of the finalists. Um, and we'll rotate the order and in in, in how those are answered. So um, each candidate will take a turn being the first one to have to answer, um, which comes with the disadvantage of not knowing the question ahead of time. Um, so we'll be rotating that way. Um, once we've gone through all of the nine questions and all the applicants have had a chance to uh, answer them, um, at that point, council then will be ready to make their deliberations on who they want to appoint. Um, so one, one option that council has, and this is an option for council at any point during this meeting, um, you can convene into executive session in the back room. You can discuss the applicants that are uh, before you. You can talk about their qualifications, but that's the extent of what can occur in executive session. So there can't be any discussion about how council members might vote or you know, preferences or priorities. Um, the executive session is limited only to discussing the particular qualifications of each applicant. Um, any council member can ask for an executive session. And if there's consensus from the rest of council, then you can go into executive session. Um, but that executive session, um, that, that can occur at, at any point during this. So if you wanna do it after the three minute introductions, you can do it. Can do it then if you want to do it um, after the round of interview questions with the four council members you can do it at that time too um, it's really at council's discretion um, so once the interviews are concluded and council is ready to vote the process for that is going to be um, council members will each individually nominate someone uh, that they would like to have a vote on whether or not they're the applicant um, so not all council members have to nominate someone um, there can be multiple nominations or there can only be one. Um, it's really up to council how many they want to vote on. Uh, once we've determined the number of who are the nominees, then council will vote uh, by paper ballot, uh, same as before. And if, uh, if any of the applicants receives four votes, then uh, that person will become the new council member. Um, if we do a, a vote and no applicant receives four votes, then we'll vote again. Um, if we have three candidates and say uh, two candidates receive more than one, then for the second round of voting, the, the candidate that received the least amount of votes would be left off the next ballot. Um, so that's kind of the process in a nutshell. Um, if there's any questions, I can answer them now or I can help out throughout the process as we go along. 
Okay. Uh, that sums up my introduction. I think we're ready to move on to the next step. Okay, great. Thank you, Josh. And uh, because this is my first time doing this particular meeting, I probably will rely heavily on our city clerk. So I really appreciate him being here um, and council as well. If you have questions for Josh at any time, please don't hesitate to put your light on and, and we can um, ask those questions. So welcome again to the applicants. Welcome also Linda online. Thank you for joining us. Can you hear us okay, by the way? Okay, wonderful. Um, okay, so as Josh stated, you will have three minutes to introduce yourselves. Um, and then and state the reasons for your candidacy. And we're gonna go in the order that's on the agenda. So Linda Sutherland, you will be first. And we don't have, you You might not be able to see the timer, but maybe um, Josh, do you, can we do like a timer on a phone? Do you want me to do like a timer on my phone? Okay, perfect, thanks, thanks Josh. Okay, thank you, Linda, welcome. And your three minutes is begun. I want to tell you right from the start that it probably won't take three minutes to tell you everything. <clears throat> this was very difficult for me because I don't like to talk about myself, but I enjoy talking about politics. So I put that and I weighed it and I said, well, I think the politics outweighs the, the um, not like to talk about myself, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> but um, I come from a very political background. My whole family, we talked about politics over dinner. I was in, you know, I was a child during the um, Vietnam War, so we talked a lot about that. Um, for 35 years, I worked for the government, which was required that it be nonpartisan. But that never ruled out the, the obligation that I could um, write to my congressmen and to my representatives and actually to the president of the United States if I wanted to. So I know that I wanted to make my voice heard because I think that it's important. So <clears throat> like I said, I want to, I am less of a talker than a doer. So I wanna get in here and um, make a difference is why I wanna get involved. Like I said, for 35 years, I really couldn't be partisan. So I could never be part of uh, the process, um, but I always made a pest of myself and wrote letters and whatever. So now I think I want a chance to do something. I saw that the um, newly elected board members are right along the lines that I want to follow up. So I wanted to be part of the, the team that's putting together the council for um, Gig Harbor. Um, some of the things that I liked about the, the candidates and the selectees were that um, we want to make Gig Harbor a place to walk, um, to keep it vibrant. Um, to be a Northwest town. And that's my biggest focus. I moved here in 2018 and I just loved the, the town and the people. I wanna keep that and I wanna be a part of the movement to stay as a gig harbor. Also, I, I wanna mention that I'm a very big environmentalist. So the thing about um, keeping gig harbor green with parks, walkability, um, I lived in Germany for many, many years. Uh, one of the biggest things that I liked about that area was the Fußwegs. We could walk everywhere. Um, we used to take shortcuts. There was a city planned Fußweg that we could walk from our house to downtown. So we had all the ways to, 30 to seconds, walk. Like, what, what's that? 30 seconds. Oh, wow, that went fast. So anyway, that's where I wanted to, to go. Some of the things that I, I don't know whether we want to say what we would like to do, but that's the, the one that I'd like to pursue is the keep the city vibrant, walkable, um, bikeable, uh, a good community of interaction. So pretty quick, I guess that went faster than I thought, but that's about it then, I guess. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. And thank you all. Uh, next will be Loretto Tessasini. I hope I said your last name correctly and you can uh, come on forward. And I think that mic is on, correct? Already? Yes. Yeah. And Mayor, I'll just make a quick note for everyone too that the, that the lights on the podium, the yellow light means you have one minute left. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Hi. So, well, I'll just get right into it. Uh, 
My name is Loretto Tessicini, and thank you for accepting my application and for coming before you today. It's clear to me that a tremendous amount of time and energy has been invested by many people, both within government and civic organizations, mm -hmm. in making environmental sustainability a top priority. Examples include Gig Harbor's two-year strategic plan, last August CCC PAC summary, and Pierce County's greenhouse gas reduction plan, among with many others. What stands out from reviewing the above is that 2023 will be a pivotal year for Gig Harbor, and I very much would like to be a participant with the council. An intriguing confluence of events was the council's plan to review the design manual in 2023. This would be a fantastic opportunity to incorporate elements from any number of sustainable design approaches, from the natural step framework um, to um, any other elements, including the circular economy. Adding a coherent set of sustainable design guidelines for city planning would, I believe, be a huge step in increasing environmental resiliency for the city of Gig Harbor. As a member of the council, I would like to work with the council and others in exploring an additional means of implementing environmental sustainability within the public sphere, and that being system dynamics. Given the complex local and global challenges surrounding environmental sustainability, experience has shown me that the success of complex projects impacting living systems is extremely sensitive to initial conditions, meaning that small changes at the start of a project can result in large unforeseen changes at a later time and in unexpected locations. The application of system dynamics can help mitigate this. To, assess, to successfully change the behavior of complex living systems, we need to understand the underlying dynamics and the impacts that we as designers and implementers have in the system undergoing change. When that is accomplished, value can then be found in the way Gig Harbor incorporates and learns from change. This process of utilizing system dynamics would also help in increasing the odds of success for weaving together the elements of environmental sustainability and enhancing the growth of Gig Harbor's historical preservation efforts. Success favors those who are prepared. And if we want our children and our future generations to have a chance in attaining success in their lives, then we need to prepare the way for those opportunities, for those successful paths. My hope is that by strengthening and attenuating Gig Harbor structurally, or greater adaptability to change, then the changes coming in the near future becomes more understandable and navigable and will lead to healthy growth. Everything we have, everything comes from the earth. And I believe that Gig Harbor can be a leader in showing how the environmental sustainability can be accomplished. Thank you. So, so. Thank you so much. Um, our next candidate is Ben Coronado. Welcome. Hello, Mayor, uh, members of council. Uh, good afternoon. Um, like I said, my name is Ben Coronado, and uh, I believe I, I would be a good candidate for city council um, to fill the position um, as I bring a keen understanding of community needs and priorities. I've been a part of the Parks Commission for seven years, um, chaired it for the last four. I've had a direct contact with many members of the public. I um, have had the pleasure of communicating with lots of people through drafting the pros plan, through um, being a part of, the, part of the planning commission years back, um, drafting the shoreline master program as well. Um, I've been a part of uh, quite a few projects here with the city and, and I'm looking forward to kind of expand on that and take that to the next step. Um, I believe the person that you appoint today um, should be one who is in tune with the wants and needs of the public, one who understands how to build consensus and work with the citizens, staff, and council members um, with their divergent pers uh, perspectives and ideologies. One who wants the best for the city and the people who live, work, and play here. I believe I could be that person. I'm a longtime resident who has been blessed to call Gig Harbor home for many years. I am a parent, a business owner, and product of our community. I'm a Gig Harbor High School graduate and alumni of the University of Washington, where I, my studies were focused in economics and sustainable urban development. My career has been focused in transportation, policy, and regulation. Recently during the pandemic, there was a call to action from Superintendent Barr for the desperate need of substitute teachers. I heard that call. I took that action. I am now a substitute teacher for our district. <clears throat> I am also a part owner and operator of a building science company. We test buildings for air leakage, me mechanical equipment, and grade building energy efficiencies. I have experience working with nonprofits and volunteering my time to give back to my community that provides so much to me. I've been a part of the Gig Harbor Planning Commission as we drafted the Shoreline Master Program, as I mentioned. 
I have been on the Parks Commission for seven years. I've had the pleasure of working with other community members on development throughout the Theofoss Waterway as part of the uh, Urban Design Review Committee on the as the Theofoss Waterway Development Authority. Um, I am also a Central Puget Sound Water Steward for the Center for Alternatives to Pesticides. Um, I was looking on the website, what's called for by the MSRC for appointing a, a new council member. And um, I ran into this and it kind of stuck with me. A good public servant must help each other, or good public servants must help each other and the public stay focused on the future and on the common good. There will always be occasions when elected officials differ, differ among themselves, but the mark of good leadership is the ability to handle those differences in ways that move the agenda forward, build trust, and create a civic culture of mutual respect that makes progress possible. The person that you appoint today must be one that you know will be a good fit to work with this council. I believe I could be that person and I hope you do too. Thank you for all your time and your service to our community. Thank you so much. Um, our next candidate is Daniel Hobbs. Good afternoon. Thank you for participating in this process. Uh, my name is Daniel Hobbs. I've lived here in Gig Harbor since 2013, so I'm pushing 10-year anniversary here. Puget Sound-wise, I've lived in the area, I'd say, since 1980, so sounds like about 42 years. Um, I became very interested in politics on the national and state scene um, approximately six years ago in about 2015 or 2016. Uh, as over the last six years, I've seen a lot going on, um, on in those two arenas. And um, an axiom that I think I would like to follow is uh, if you're thinking in a big picture way about politics, then uh, you might act locally. And so that has driven my uh, interest in uh, putting in for this position. I've never run for anything. Um, I've never been a candidate, so I've never lost an election. <laughs> <laughs> but um, having said that, uh, my background right now, I'm a, um, about a 16 years of experience working with the Boeing company. Um, I think what's germane perhaps to this council is um, for in Seattle from 1998 to 2006 for eight years in Seattle, I worked with a social services organization that participated heavily in a public private um, funding scheme. Um, I was business manager over a uh, about a $3 million a year operating budget, um, about 1.75 million of that per year uh, came from all levels of government, uh, city, county, uh, um, state, and federal. So um, that would be what I believe is some of the germane experience I might have with, in this sort of a position. Um, Thank you for your time. I think um, I probably said um, all of that I can bear bring to mind at this time. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, our next candidate is Julie Amon. And please let me know if I said your name correctly as well. <laughs> Thank you. Julie Amon. Amon. <laughs> yes. I'm going to make a note. Thank, thank you for asking. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of council, administrative staff, and citizens of Gig Harbor. It is an honor to be here today in consideration for the city council position. Council members, thank you for listening to my family's feedback during the recent meetings. Your professionalism and leadership gives me a great source of pride in my city. As I was observing the exchange of ideas during a council work session, a light bulb went off. I approach challenges with the same principles I learned in architecture school. All projects present constraints. These issues steer you to solve problems creatively and with innovation. I can support the council with diverse viewpoints to inform your decision-making. Today, I'm a writer and photographer. My career in journalism began in television news for the Christian Science Monitor, followed by PBS NewsHour and Frontline. My stories profiling local businesses appear in Gig Harbor now. As a journalist, you research all points of view. To write any story or produce any documentary, you have to learn your subject. 
communicate effectively, synthesize complicated information, and then process those facts into something that makes sense to the everyday person. These are the skills that I could bring for benefit to the, to the council. I have a long history of working collaboratively with partners committed to tackling poverty and improving the lives for women and children in Africa. I became a founding board member of nonprofit Circle of Friends in Action. That means strategic planning, building community and local business relationships, developing leadership programs, all complex problem solving that makes a difference in people's lives. Whether it's working on a film set, a corporate event, or photographing women in the villages of Eastern Uganda, I have learned to navigate all landscapes, creating relationships of trust and respect along the way. Work life is synonymous with family life for me. My first job was organizing toilet paper in the janitor's closet as a grade schooler in my family's 120 year old business in Eastern Washington. I know how important small businesses are to a local community. I'm the daughter of a creative single mother who struggled economically, who worried about paying her property taxes even in the final days of her life. I'm a wife to Chris, my childhood sweetheart who prefers the mountains and playing tag to the office. I'm mom to Will, a film director and Patrick, a UW student who challenge me and inspire me on a daily basis. These are my life influencers. I'm a longtime Gig Harper resident in the West Side, a neighborhood not yet rep represented on the council. I've logged hundreds of volunteer hours in my children's schools over the years. I've served on the 2008 Downtown Economic Development Committee. I support economic vitality in preserving Gig Harbor's historic character, natural aesthetic, while ensuring responsible growth and smart planning. If given the opportunity, I will embrace consensus building and creating an engaging and inclusive community. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know that buzzer is very annoying, but yeah. <laughs> um, our next candidate is Julie Martin. Thank you. I'm going to try not to have to hear that again, okay? <laughs> yes, <laughs> welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. My name is Julie Martin, and I reside in Gig Harbor for the last four and a half years. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my professional experience and why I'm interested in filling this vacant position. I would like to help contribute to this great city, just like those before me and what you're currently doing for all of us at this moment. Thanks to the council members who have taken the time and the mayor for talking to me and share your experience and point of view of the work of the council and that and the accomplishments of this great staff that works for us. I was born in Troline, Washington. I've lived in Geek Harbor since May of 2018, as I mentioned. Prior to that, I lived in Tacoma, Chicago, Ruston, Seattle, and Alaska. I have a graduate degree from the University of Washington Nevin School of Public Administration, and I recently retired in November of last year as the Chief of Staff for the Washington Department of Corrections after serving for that department for eight years. I held several positions with the department and had oversight and leadership responsibilities for things like HR, IT, operations, finance, and budget, strategic planning, legislative affairs, and policy development, and labor negotiations. I also had the opportunity to hear from many stakeholders who were very passionate about their loved ones being incarcerated. And sometimes that was difficult. Sometimes the criticism they had was true, and we had to listen to that. Sometimes it wasn't based on facts, but more on emotions, and that too I listened to. I responded to them by the facts, listening to them and building a relationship and knowing some days we would never come to a conclusion on what was important to them, but that we would keep trying and my door was always open. I've worked for the government for over 18 years. Prior to that, I also worked for private industry for 25 years for such companies as McDonald's, IGT Gaming, and GE in various management positions. And in my 30 years of management experience, it lends to fulfilling the role of city council from understanding and seeking output and input from staff, stakeholders, legislative bodies, and government agencies, working collaboratively with professional groups of people to develop policies that meet current and future needs. If I have the opportunity to serve this great city, I'll make sure that I am very well aware of this that gets involved and getting in the way of things such as the RCWs, WACs, current policies, et cetera. 
This city continues to grow at a fast pace, but the staff, city administrator, council and mayor are charting a qualitative and quantitative data informed path forward and development of the use of the city strategic plan, state growth management act, various commissions, the soon to be published urban forest management plan, the pros plan and citizen and business input will help guide this city for the future and present needs that we are all looking forward to. There are many challenges other cities higher than, have higher than expected growth, climate change challenges, housing and social service needs. I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. And our final candidate is Larry Bradbury. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I wanna thank you all for your volunteer service. Um, many of you probably remember me because you've interviewed me before, since I sit on several uh, committees now. Um, and the basic reason why I'm standing here today is I want to expand uh, the ability to communicate and, and contribute to our community's growth and development. My life has been centered around public service, uh, 27 years as a, as a military member, uh, committing my life throughout the world. Uh, after I retired, I did the same thing uh, through service in the Corps of Engineers. In that, in that capacity, I had major projects throughout Washington State contributing uh, measurably to the safety and economic security and development of our state. Um, subsequent to that, I dedicated the remainder of my career to health care, serving the men and women in uniform and their families. Uh, because of that service, I did not have much opportunity to get involved directly in community activities, such as you are involved in as uh, members of the city council. Uh, now that I am retired, I have the opportunity to do that. Uh, I have done that and would like to continue to do it some more. Uh, I believe I can provide to the city and to the council some specific advantages. Uh, the majority of my career was in contracting and acquisitions, uh, dealing with contracts of $100 million or more uh, throughout the world. That allows me to bring a, a very unique perspective to the evaluation of contracts that the city might be entertaining. Uh, I think that's important because I will bring a balanced view to the issues that the council faces, and they are many, uh, specifically very rapid growth, uh, some new constraints being put into place by the state, such as the uh, Urban Growth Management Act. And all these require very unique views in order to manage these conflicting priorities, uh, particularly when we try and balance our budgetary requirements to the needs of the community and achieving the goals uh, of uh, maintaining our community character that we all hold dear. Uh, I believe very strongly in having a, a good balance between how we spend those resources and what they spend them on. And, and I will just give you one example there. Uh, I, I have spent time in Mississippi. I have property there. Uh, near where I live, there was a mental hospital that closed in 1935. Uh, unfortunately, in those days, that was a place where people essentially went to die. And there were thousands of people who did and were buried in the, oh, wow, that was fast. It anyway, does go by, it does go uh, by fast. They, uh, the state has authorized $4 million to dig up those graves. And I do not consider that a good cost benefit. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. you all have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you to all. I don't envy council's decision. Um, so, Councilmember Likens, I saw you going for your light. So, yeah, thank yes. you. Um, I just wanted, thank you, Mayor. I wanted to say thank you to everybody that came and spoke today. Um, I'm sure that others on the council agree with me on this as well. It takes a lot in the public process to come forward and we appreciate your willingness to serve. The other thing I wanted to point out is that there are going to be several board and commission openings in the upcoming year. So if today, for some reason, you aren't appointed, please know that there are, I believe, Josh, it's over 23 um, openings or positions that will be up for reappointment in 2023 on 
the Design Review Board, Planning Commission, Parks Commission. So if you're interested, um, we would love your support. And it's a great way as a segue if you ever eventually want to do council. So I just wanted to put that out there and thank everybody. And deep breaths, you got through it. Well done, thanks. Thank you. Any other comments from council? Okay, not seeing any lights. Um, so at this point, council, if you are ready to vote by paper ballot, you have each a notepad in front of you. And I'm not seeing anyone requesting anything. So we'll go ahead with that. So write um, the, your name at the top of the paper. Or Josh, if you want to remind, remind them of the yeah, Yes, uh, each council member should write their name at the top of the paper and then the names of four of the candidates that they'd like to see in the interview process. Mm -hmm. And uh, while you're doing that, I'm just going to go and move the podium and set up the tables and then I'll collect those and tally them up. to start, yeah. So Josh will come by and collect your ballots in just a moment. That's okay. It's all good. We have to get some microphones set up for our candidate panel. Oh, yeah. Um, Council is request, requesting a quick break. Why don't we take a five minute break and then we can get everything set up. All right. So uh, we'll reconvene at 138. Welcome back to the Gig Harbor City Council special meeting of Tuesday, January 10th, 2023. The time is 141 p.m. And we will go into um, item number three, where city clerk has tallied up the voting results of the council members. Yes, and I'll read the, the uh, votes as written by each council member uh, for the record. Council member Rodenberg, Daniel Hobbs, Julie Martin, Larry Bradbury, Ben Coronado. From council member Wook, Julie Martin, Julie Amon, Laredo Tessasini, and Ben Coronado. From council member Storset, Ben Coronado, Daniel Hobbs, Julie Martin, Julie Amon. From Councilmember Barber, Julie Martin, Julie Amon, Ben Coronado, and Daniel Hobbs. From Councilmember Henderson, Julie Amon, Julie Martin, Ben Coronado, and Laredo Tessini. And from Councilmember Likens, Ben Coronado, Julie Amon, Julie Martin, and Larry Bradbury. And so given those uh, votes, the four candidates that will be moving on to the final round are Ben Coronado, Julie Amon, Julie Martin, and Daniel Hobbs. Um, so the four finalists, if you would like to come forward and uh, have a seat at the table, uh, we can move on to the next round. Great, thank you so much. So Josh, I will do my best to figure out the order of rotating the we'll, questions. We will have the order for rotating questions for you here shortly. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, just a reminder for this round, um, I may not have said it earlier, but each candidate will have two minutes to respond to each question. So we've, we've got the timer light on the table there in front of you. Um, the light should turn yellow at the halfway one minute mark. So um, you'll each have two minutes to respond to each question. Um, and the mayor and council will take turns asking the questions. Um, Thank you. 
And we can begin when Council and Mayor are ready. Okay. I think I understand. <laughs> yes. Well, the Council, you don't have to worry. I will call on you when it's time for your question. I just have to make sure I'm doing this in the right order. Okay, so it looks like our the first candidate to answer a question will be Ben Coronado. And this is a question from myself. I will also, um, so each question was written or once or was um, presented to be asked by the person that is asking the question, just so you know. Um, so Ben, if you would please define your understanding of the role of a city council member and then what and then what qualities do you feel make someone an effective city council member? Okay, so the role of city council member would be to represent the citizenry of this fine city of Big Harbor. Um, you know, being in touch with the community through different affairs, being um, aware of what's going on in representing the people, um, be that, you know, at community events and talking to the public at, you know, public meetings. Um, I think being in tune with the public is, is keen in understanding what your role is. Um, you know, what the wants, desires, needs of the community might be. Um, being effective is being able to overcome adversity, being able to work with other council members in writing effective policy, in um, managing the public finances, um, the fiduciary uh, um, obligations of the city, uh, working well with staff members, um, you know, being respectful throughout community meetings of people's opinions and perspectives, um, and finding ways to um, overcome adversity. Um, and working with one another effectively, I think makes you really effective. Thank you so much. And then Julie, I wrote, I, Amen, yes. I got it right. You are next to answer right. this question. So define your understanding of the role of a city council member, and then what qualities do you feel makes someone an effective city council member? Right, I think the city is, uh, sorry, the city council is what's guiding our city as we move forward. It's about working together. It's about building consensus. Um, it's about learning the issue and listening to all sides. Um, I think it's important also to communicate with the citizens. And I would hope that as we move forward in this really important year with a lot of important topics, that we are able to connect with the community in order to explain the important issues coming up and that then informs us the city council in making a good smart decision thank you and the next question is for the this same question is for julie martin um, define your understanding of the role of a city council member and describe what qualities you feel make someone an effective city council member thank you it's to represent the citizens of, of this great city it's also to listen to business needs, environmental needs, and understanding of what is uh, required of a council member. It is to work with staff and the other council members here and other legislative bodies that have an impact to the city. It is to attack, if you will, um, current issues that you have in an understandable and forthright way to be transparent to the issues at hand. And it is also to look at the data and the research that uh, is available to us to make good informed decisions. And I hope have very great debates, professional debates with council members on saying, what is the best thing for this citizen read moving forward and in the future? So when we move here um, 15, 20 years from now, those that do will enjoy what we're enjoying today. Thank you. Thank you. And finally to Daniel Hobbs, um, define your understanding of the role of a city council member and then what qualities do you feel make someone an effective city council member? My understanding would be that the role of the city council member is to um, primarily set vision and guide the community um, through, for lack of a better term, legislative process of establishing ordinances, codes, regulations. Um, I would certainly echo what the other three candidates have said in terms of having a quality of uh, robust debate, negotiation, um, oral communication skills. Um, so I think that's how I would answer. 
Thank you so much. Um, so our second question will be from Councilmember Storset, and Julie Amon, you will be the first one. Okay. Oh. Amen. All right, I'm I'll repeat get the it. question, you know, each time, unless you guys are taking notes. Um, all right, what skills or knowledge do you have to offer the city council to differentiate you and complement the council? I think, as I mentioned in my statement, I have an educational background in architecture, and that's where I learned a lot of problem solving skills. And I think that's an essential component of being a council member. Uh, I also have experience in the nonprofit world and um, in creating uh, strategic planning and also working with all stakeholders. And I think it's really essential as we move forward that um, we take into account all of the, the variables, whether it be within the community or the business community and make a, a decision based on, on all of those stakeholders. So I would say that I bring both the academic and the nonprofit experience um, to the job. Thanks. The next person to answer will be Julie Martin. Julie, what skills or knowledge do you have to offer the city council to differentiate you and complement the council? Thank you. I think the balance of 18 years in the public sector and 25 years in the private sector, um, dealing with everything from very difficult budgets, understanding that there is a unique viewpoint from everyone's perspective, being able to use research, uh, data, being able to listen to people, quantitative is not the only thing, you need to have the qualitative piece to that as well. And the difference that I would bring is that I seek to really listen to what is the nugget that someone's trying to tell you. Uh, everything I had to do in my workplace, there was a lot of passion about Department of Corrections recently. And what is it the person's really trying to say? What is their need? What do I need to take away from that encounter with that person? And what do I need to do with it, if anything? And what do I need to sit and listen to that and store it away for maybe future and be a responsible person to them and let people know their value, both from staff and from the council members and the mayor and the citizenry of Gig Harbor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person to answer will be Daniel Hobbs. Right. Daniel, what skills or knowledge do you have to offer the city council to differentiate you and complement the council? Um. Frankly, I could name some skills um, that I probably need to obtain through the process, um, such as a better negotiation handling. Um, I think that uh, <laughs> consensus building, again, would be something I haven't had broad experience with, but um, I believe that that would be a very useful skill. Um, I think the ability to listen, the ability to respect other people, um, and then just, um, I think I've mentioned before, a certain amount of uh, um, oral communication skills. Um, I think what I bring, in terms of um, to the council, which I would love to be recommended for, is um, an experience with uh, um, within the public domain. Um, I mentioned social services background. Um, there, I was the business manager, and um, so uh, with dealing with uh, functions functionaries in different government positions um including elected and staff people um for six or eight years um yeah just in general the an openness to um mold myself around ideas good ideas um and at the same time to be able to uh, express and stand my ground, so. Councilmember Wook? Is it appropriate to ask a follow-up question? 
Uh, after the uh, formal interview questions, there's a time for council members to ask follow-up questions. So I think it would be appropriate to hold until then. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so if you would like to write them down and, and um, hold them till the end, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next will be Ben Coronado. Ben, same question. What skills or knowledge do you have to offer the city council to differentiate you and complement the council? Um, I would say I come with a couple of skills. I come with experience working um, with a few of you in particular on the Parks Commission. Um, I have experience um, with reviewing the Parks uh, Capital Projects budget um, in review of uh, capital projects and working on policy for parks. Um, I also, like I said in my um, I have experience on the planning commission writing the shoreline master program helping draft that so i do have experience in regulation policy specifically within the city and working with members of the community within our city um, writing effective policy um, that's still in use today and and hopefully for the future i also have um, hi historic knowledge i've been here for decades and you know i know a lot of longtime um, residents and and a lot of the history of the area um, i'm also you know as a parks commissioner, I've had the opportunity to work with the museum director and, and you know, uh, Mayor Markley. And, you know, there's a lot of knowledge to be gained there too from sitting in on learning the history of some of these parcels that the city owns and that the that the citizenry want and have asked for, um, you know, whether that be waterfront parcels or access to waterfront or um, trails and, and connectivity between our parks and our, and our um, public facilities. So I think, and, and I know um, a term you guys like to use is drinking uh, from a fire hose, you know, and I, <laughs> as far as the budget goes, you know, I, I don't have that experience, but I would say mine's more like a garden hose where it's like, it's <laughs> time kind of drinking out of it a little bit. You know, I've sat in on your public meeting, on the public meetings for the budget and, you know, I've experienced some of that, you know, I'm not in the behind the scenes stuff, but I follow you guys. I get it. I want to be a part of this. So thank you. Thank you. And I think for ease of process, council members, if I, um, when I call you for your question, I'll tell you the order if you want to just write it down, unless you want me to continue calling. That's a good, good point. That, I think that might be about less awkward for everyone. So <laughs> we're learning as we go here. This is a new process. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, this, it is better than last year. That's right. We, we are, yes, it's much better seeing you all in person. Very, very much. And this next question is for me, and then we will start with the less awkward process after that. So um, the first uh, question is for Julie Martin. And what would you like Gig Harbor to look like in 10 years? And what would you like to see change or stay the same? That's a big question. Uh, well, to say it stays the same, I don't think is being realistic. So I, I will just put that out there. Hopefully we'll be able to keep much of our trees that we love, the pathways, the parks, et cetera. Uh, I love the downtown, the waterfront area. I think we have to be realistic about the fact that there's climate change. We just recently had a king tide that was a bit devastating, not to the level that California is facing. So I would like us to be able to have good, robust conversations, really think about and look at the data to say, what's it gonna look like in 10 years and what do we do need to do to prepare for that? I don't know what it's gonna look like in 10 years. What I'd like to do is to be able to keep it as well as we can based on what citizens are asking for today, but we've got to get ahead of it. And I'm not suggesting that that's not being done today, but that we can't forget about the fact that while things are current that we need to do now, the budget's important now, what are those things we need to plan for and get that plan put in place? I think the strategic plan is laid out very, very well for the city. I think there's going to be one that needs to probably go five, six, seven years, which is typical for many organizations. And I'd like to be a part of that. I think if we do those types of things, we can set forward a city that has the same values that we have now, that we listen to our citizens, listen to businesses, make it a viable place for our children to grow up, for citizens to want to live. Um, hopefully we'll be able to reduce some of the, the crime that's ticking up, not just in Gig Harbor, but across all the state of Washington, quite frankly, across the U.S. for various reasons. So that's what I would, uh, my, my vision for the city is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next uh, person is Daniel Hobbs. What would you like Gig Harbor to look like in 10 years? And what would you like to see the, see change or stay the same? On a personal level, um, we traveled to Texas and what I really love, <laughs> we have excellent water. Um, so I'd like clean water 
Um, I'd like law and order as mentioned, alluded to by the previous candidate. Um, this community definitely does have a feeling to it. No offense, but I separated out from the rest of Pierce County. Um, I've lived here, as I've said, I've lived here a long time. It's an incredible area. This is an incredible community within that area. Um, I hope it can stay the same at the same time. Um, there's certainly developmental development that has to happen. Um, when I was in college, uh, the three counties, Pierce, Snohomish, King, were approximately one and a half million people. They're now about three million as, as I count it. Um, Gig Harbor will take on some of the burden of that growth, I'm sure. Um, I certainly think that de in development, I believe developers are need to be held responsible for their piece of infrastructure, the, um, the burden of of the infrastructure due to the to due to the developments that happen. Um, so um, keep it organized. Keep the keep the traffic flowing. Um, keep the downtown the harbor um, quaint. So I'd like that for at least 10 years, maybe in perpetuity. Thank you so much. Um, and for Ben Coronado, what would you like Gig Harbor to look like in 10 years? And what would you like to see change or stay the same? You know, 10 years in the term, in the vision of public policy and, and, and government, is not a long time. It takes a very long time to do things. And I understand that. You know, I worked on the Parks Commission for seven years and it took us that long to get the honoring statue down there. Seven years to get a piece of art. 10 years is not a long time. So, you know, I, I think being realistic, you know, following our strategic plans, our pros plans, our urban growth, you know, following all these plans is what help us keep in line and going and toward charging towards that goal of what we would like for Gig Harbor to look like in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Um, as far as what I would like to change, yeah, the crime, the traffic, you know, all the basic wants of everybody else that live here, you know, we want this, you know, quintessential picture perfect area and, you know, we're close, I feel like, and, and how to preserve that, you know, is like, ugh, you know, but everybody wants to be here, I get it. And so, um, you know, there's that, that hard balance of, of finding ways to, you know, preserve that charm and, and still be inclusive and, you know, people want to live here and it being accepting of that. Um, you know, that's, that's something I've struggled with. And, you know, from years on the Parks Commission is, okay, how do you find that balance? How do you work with that? How do you, you know, it's like people want to live here, but you also want to keep the same. And that same, lots of towns experience that. And so I guess what I want to say the same is, you know, making sure that our downtown core stays somewhat similar. That's, you know, I would say the biggest piece of the charm of Gig Harbor is that downtown core and making sure that stays somewhat similar intact, you know, and then finding a way for, you know, our kids to, you know, find play and enjoy the same community we grew up in and, you know, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And finally, for Julie Amon, what would you like Gig Harbor to look like in 10 years? And what would you like to see changed or stay the same? Thank you. Um, I think in the next 10 years, um, I think, as was mentioned by others, keeping the downtown vibrant is important. I also think all of Gig Harbor uh, should be kept um, vibrant and considering our green spaces and our, our um, the our infrastructure and how um, even in the outside areas of Gig Harbor, we need to keep mindful of um, uh, both density and tree line coverage. Um, I think, as you know, I'm in the neighborhood off of 38 and um, that has been impacted by our increased growth. And so it's important also, I think, as we move forward in the 10 years and we, we go through um, hopefully slower growth that we keep mindful of all the areas within Gig Harbor. Um, if I were to change anything, I, I think I would like to, to see more um, arts in Gig Harbor. I'm very supportive of 
of having activities for children. I have two grown sons that I've raised here that with my husband, um, but I'd also like to see um, increase opportunity in arts within Gig Harbor. Um, and then of course, the traffic obviously, <laughs> um, that comes with growth um, and efforts to, to mitigate that. But I think that's something that you've been looking, looking towards. Uh, another concern I have is um, if, uh, a proposal has been um, set forth that might um, change zoning across the state for communities over 6,000 people. That would be Gig Harbor. And if we move forward, or if that happens, I would hope that we would have a good plan to handle that. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question will come from Councilmember Barber, and that if you want to write down the order, it will be Daniel. Hobbs first, Ben Coronado second, Julie Amon third, and Julie Martin fourth. Thank you. So, Daniel, let's say mine is a scenario based. Mm. The council is discussing an issue of which you're unfamiliar. You have read the packet of material provided by staff and asked them questions. Could you please describe what else you might do leading to the council's discussion and deliberation? What process would you use to make a decision? Thank you. Um, I think what I'd like to believe is that I make objective analysis for for different things. Um, so not assuming that the package itself is in any way sh short, <laughs> but that my understanding could be fuller. Um, I would seek out some data. Um, I would seek out more information that's publicly available, which there is usually a, in this day and age, a treasure trove of. Um, I think that's exactly how a representative democ dem democratic form of government works is, is it's not necessarily experts that you've elected, but, but it certainly needs to be people who have a, a wisdom, a, a yearn for, um, subject that they they need to dive into the subject. Um, so um, that I, again, a lot of this, I like the idea that I might cultivate in myself a little bit better. Um, so um, to me, that's the that's the function with the with the council member. Obviously, within your own body, there probably is expertise anyway. People become experts. Um, so um, it, it, this would also be another area where uh, intercommunication with the rest of the council would, would be um, helpful. Thank you. So Ben Coronado, do you need me to read it again? I don't. Okay. okay. So um, what process would I use to make a decision I'm unfamiliar with um, is that I would not look to recreate the wheel. I would look at what other municipalities have done, what other places have done or with that experience and, and pull data from that. And also while working with other council members, um, communicating with them and members of the community um, to see what really is the problem and what you're trying to solve of that problem. Um, so coming in with an open mind and, and being open to an, an, an open exchange of ideas um, while also looking at all ideas, you know, whether how wacky they are or not, but being open minded and, and being willing to work with other people, I think is important. Um, yeah. Um, Thank you. Amen. Yes. Do you want me to repeat it? No, that's okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, preparing for this meeting, uh, I did exactly that. I well went through many packets on the website, <laughs> um, but 
with that background in journalism and documentaries, I'm very experienced at taking deep dives into subjects. And that's just what I did. For example, with short-term rentals, I looked across the country to see what other cities were doing and what policies they were um, setting forth. Um, I look to uh, see what people, uh, what articles have been written on the subject. And I will spend sometimes hours um, searching to see uh, what what's being said. And part of the, the helpfulness of that is uh, journalists do a good job of putting issues into context. Um, I would, of course, look at all comments um, from the public to see how they feel. I might even reach out to some of those organizations um, and find out from them firsthand what they thought. And, uh, and I would look also into history. What, what have we done before? Um, are there, sometimes when we look back into history, that helps inform us um, so that we can make a better decision like, you know, and then the council's not always the same, right? We've had other people doing this for a while. So look back and see what some of the pros and cons for previous councils um, um, were. And then of course, experts. Experts, I love uh, academics in the field, especially if it's like urban planning and growth. There's also a lot of interesting uh, nonprofit organizations, especially in the area of, of, of growth. Um, so that's probably how I would handle it is take my typical journalistic deep dive and then come to the table with those facts and figures. Great. Thank you. Julie Martin, would you like me to repeat it? I think I've got it. Thank okay. you. Uh, first, I would thank the staff because chances are I probably asked them a few questions and they're getting a little tired of me. Uh, then I would ask if <laughs> then I would ask if council members one on one and not doing something against the Open Public Meetings Act would have time to meet with me to give me their perspective and the mayor as well. Reaching out to the citizens uh, if it's a business related. I'd also look at the city of council governments um, and looking at what they have. And then evidence-based programming, there's so much being done out there in so many different fields and seeing what else has been out there. I think it's important to decide what resource you choose to look at and what you choose to believe. Um, the internet has a lot of information out there and so you have to be a, a critical thinker when you're reviewing things. I would take a look at is there are other opportunities to meet with different legislative bodies, whether that's Pierce County, was that germane to the issue at hand? Um, the city, state government, et cetera, and talk to them about if there's other resources I should be considering. Uh, there's a lot of independent uh, study groups and think groups out there that I think are important to take into account, things that we may not think of, things I may not think of, and just think that the, that's kind of a fringe viewpoint, but yet I need to take a look at that and decide if that's something that's germane to the issue at hand. So I would do all of that. Uh, and hopefully come forward with the best knowledge I could to make a decision. And if I really felt like I was off kilter and didn't understand it, I have to be open and say that. Say there's just something that I'm not understanding here about this particular issue. And is there some other resource that I should be looking at to make a decision for the citizens of, of Gig Harbor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question will come from Councilmember Wook, and if you'd like to jot down this order, it's uh, Ben Coronado first, Julie Amon second, Julie Martin third, and Daniel Hobbs fourth. Thank you. So, Ben, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Councilmember? <laughs> so, this is my question for you. There are many wonderful people in this area who call Gig Harbor home. However, it is only the voters within the city limits that elect Gig Harbor City Council members. Will you put the desires of folks who live within the city limits first and foremost in your decision making? That's a good question. You know, I tackled this actually right in the application. I was like, okay, so what's the best way to be an effective council member filling someone else's shoes are you to you know kind of take on council member Denson's you know some of her passions and her projects and and kind of follow through with that because she was the one elected you know by the citizenry 
as opposed to, you know, doing my best to represent the people that I might be connected to. So that's something I struggled with when filling out the application, trying to understand what role to fill. Um, I understand that, you know, the, cities, the citizens of Gig Harbor are who you represent, but they're also the ones who chose to elect Robin Denson. Um, and now you're choosing to elect one of us to represent, to fill those shoes. So yes, I would, I would, I would, I would represent the citizens of Gig Harbor to the best of my ability, but there's also things outside of Gig Harbor that affect people within Gig Harbor, whether that be business owners who have shops here, or whether that be people who play in our parks here, or um, you know people who just come to do their shopping here. Um, you know they're affected by our traffic, and so what did we do? We created you know a tax on some you know we increased tax on some of our groceries so we could pay for more roads within our area, or um, you know we're creating parks for you know a larger area than just the citizens of Gig Harbor. Yes, they will be the ones who are most directly affected, but I mean it it affects people beyond our borders. Um, so I think including that in your thoughts and and your decisions is is an important factor. Um, but yeah, I think I think. The people you represent should be the you know underlying decision making. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Almond. Do you need me to read the question again? No, no. Um, so I live two houses away from county, <laughs> and so I know from just ge uh, geographically where I live that our city and our county are hand in hand. With that said, obviously, if we are a council, we're representing this, this, the city of Gig Harbor, but I do know that the decisions that the council make, they impact the entire area. Our roads, our roads traveled by everyone, not just the city members. They're also traveled by the, the county. The improvements we, we make, the improvements impact the greater area, which is a good thing. Um, and they're a little bit, the county and the city are a little bit like the, the kidney and the heart. If you have weak kidneys, the heart's not going to work and vice versa. And I think it is good to be mindful of the greater area. The decisions that are made here do impact the greater area. Um, with that said, I do think um, when we're making decisions, um, for example, down downtown harbor, uh, we have to consider the residents, for example, and the businesses where those decisions impact them. But I think that it would it, it's always important to think of um, both local and global uh, uh, results of, of decisions being made. And, and I actually think that's a good thing because um, we don't just live in this one space. We live in the larger world and what we do here uh, impacts everywhere, especially um, environmental decisions that we make. Um, they they impact what comes out of a stream goes out into the Puget Sound. So obviously, what we do here uh, has a greater impact everywhere. So, Miss Martin, would you like me to read this question again? I think I have it. Thank you. Okay. So, at, like all of us have said, we uh, we are supporting those citizens. They were they will be the ones that vote somebody in, and I take that to heart. I think uh, we have these lines that say this is the city of Gig Harbor, and you step two blocks out or two houses away, and you are no longer in the city of Gig Harbor. And we have to be aware that our decisions do impact others. And taking into account what those things are, I think is extremely important as we make decisions. Some of the big things that happen is our financial. And if it's only the citizens of Gate Harbor that are paying that bill, then I think that's a different viewpoint I have to take um, when there's a decision that has to be made and it's specifically on budget and about taxing potentially those who are citizens of Gate Harbor and there's no other method to uh, receive financial means from others outside of the city that need that service as well. We have to talk too about the fact and, and help the citizens of Gig Harbor that that happens with those who are in Pierce County or those that are in Tacoma. There are things that we, or the state of Washington, that we get the benefits of some of the things that they're taxed on that we aren't specifically taxed on. So it really, to me, depends on what the decision is that has to be made, but first and foremost, we're representing the citizens of Gig Harbor. 
We need to listen. We need to help educate. We need to explain the facts of the decision that's going to be made, but taking into account how is that going to impact things today, five years, 10 years from now. Um, I think it's a difficult situation, and you're all faced with that every single day, but it depends, I think, on what you're making a decision on, and I would have to filter that every time I do something. Thank you. Mr. Hobbs, would you like me to read the question again? Yes, I would. Thank you. All right. There are many wonderful people in this area who call Gig Harbor home. However, it is only the voters within the city limits that elect Gig Harbor City Council members. Will you put the desires of the folks who live within the city limits first and foremost in your decision making? Yes. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of functionaries in our society where people act at the exclusion of others, even though they may care for those other people and what, what their quality of life is, what their desires are and stuff. Um, I trust the citizens of Gig Harbor that they would want the community to be what it is, even though that community has, for lack of a better term, been a blessing to those that are immediately outside of the community. It's not, it's not exclusionary. They don't, you don't just, act like the other people don't exist but primarily it's a representative form of democracy and you're elected by a specific constituency and primarily and maybe exclusionary and in many cases that's who that's who you're representing so I think that's how I would answer the question um, I don't have a law degree or a or even a real estate license to understand that perhaps better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The next question will come from Council Member Likens. And if you want to jot this down, the first person will be Julie Amon, followed by Julie Martin, followed by Daniel Hobbs, and then Ben Coronado. Right Thanks. Oh, you, did you copy off my question? I did. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, Julie, or Miss Amon, good afternoon. Hi. My question, what do you feel are the three most important issues currently faced by the city? And what, if any, ideas do you have to address those issues? Uh, the first issue is growth. We've experienced a, a level of uh, great uh, growth. Um, and then um, the next would be uh, keeping our green spaces and our, our environment healthy and available to the citizens. Uh, the next, um, I know one of the hot button issues right now is the short-term rentals um, that also kind of goes into growth, but I think addressing those issues as, as it impacts growth and community is important as well. Um, and the second part of your question is uh, my, what do I would like to do. you have any ideas on how to address those or how might you address those issues? Right. I, well, first of all, I think the most important thing when we're addressing this, not the most important thing, but a unimportant part of it is listening to our community and um, and listening to um, also the administration. I know the administration has been working hard in to address some of those issues and put information out both for the council and the community. Uh, I think that making sensible decisions about growth now will protect us down the line, um, whether that be um, some sort of um, guidelines as we move forward, whether it be with the short-term rentals or or um, just as we move forward on different projects. Uh, I think that's really important. 
Um, and then with the environment, I think staying on top of, of keeping our, our green spaces. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Ms. Martin, do you want me to repeat the question? I think I have it, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, overall, I guess I'd say quality of life. I mean, that would be kind of the bucket. Of that, I would agree that growth is part of that. And how we handle that is gonna be very important, I think, to all of us. We have the urban uh, forest plan that's gonna be coming out, I believe, later on this year. That'll be interesting to see. Building the crosswalks of the Growth Management Act, the work that we wanna have done here, how do we continue to make this an economically viable city, not only to work in, but to live in. Many people work here, but can't afford to live here in Gig Harbor. Would love to, they'd love to raise their children here. They'd love to be able to participate in many of the things that we do after hours. So I think that's gonna be very important. So what I would say to that is building that crosswalk and saying, how are we gonna maneuver through so many of these things that have an impact to the growth of, of Gig Harbor? Then I would say uh, safety, and I mean by safety is not just crime, but that we have many people who are falling through the cracks with um, substance use disorders. We have people who have severe mental health issues. Our state is not one of the top states in the nation that have invested in mental health support. How is that playing out when we have growth? It is a real need for people. How do we give that helping hand up before they get so far down that it's very difficult to support them and their families and the impacts to this community. I think there are ways to do that. I think uh, though it's gonna be a big investment and I do think it's working with Pierce County, with the city and with the state to do that. It can't just all be on the city. So that's the other one. And then I would say that the, the last one would be um, is the fact that we want to be able to have a walkable city. We want to be able to have uh, children who will come in here. I think any city that, that ends up not having children in it, it just feels like it's kind of withering away to some extent. And that, that's being said by a person that's got a few years on them. Uh, children are vibrant and they bring a lot to us. So that would be the last part. Thank Thanks. you. All right, Mr. Coronado, um, would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, no. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I got, <laughs> and I wrote it down too. So Mr. Hobbs, would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. What do you feel are the three most important issues currently faced by the city? And what, if any, ideas do you have to address those issues? Um, <clears throat> I believe that safety is the number one issue. It is, unfortunately, anecdote. well, fortunately, excuse me, I have not not become a victim of crime in this town, um, but I've heard some stories. And so, um, and I've had, I've, we're on a neighborhood alert list. So, um, although we haven't been victimized ourselves, there's crime in the area. It doesn't seem to be current right now, but six months ago, there was a bit of a theft wave rolling through the neighborhood where it wasn't violent, but um, I'm, I probably would have, if I'd been victimized, I, I don't think I would have suffered property damage, but I would have suffered property loss. Um, I understand from certain retail, in certain retailers, there's quite a bit of, um, for lack of a better term, it goes on in other places in our society. Maybe it's copycat here. There's been some smash and grab type activity. Um, so I, I don't add as a larger society, how do we deal with that? Um, I think the immediate thing you do is not ascribe victimhood to the people who perpetrate those crimes, but but you uh, bring to bear the punishment of law enforcement. And if ultimately we figure out a better way of dealing with it, that would be great, but it's a little bit beyond my purview and maybe my pay, pay rank. <clears throat> um, number two is growth and development. So I, um, as mentioned earlier about keeping the downtown uh, what it is. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, now it's your turn. Mr. Coronado, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I think I got it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. So in my opinion, the three most important issues um, faced by the city is probably, as my colleagues have said, uh, growth, you know, um, being able to preserve some of the stuff that we had is important. So I think the city's done a really great job with conservation as far as obtaining new parcels of, of green space downtown um, and mitigating traffic, um, building new roundabouts to help with that. Um, creating an urban forest plan that's a step in the right direction and seeing where that might be able to take us into the future. Um, the next issue is probably uh, is safety, um, whether it be health, housing, crime. Um, I believe the city is working on putting out a job posting for uh, it was a health and, and human safety director. I think that's a great step in the right direction and, and to follow up with that because that's that's hitting our area in an unprecedented manner and um, you know it's a, it's affecting people with crime and and it's affecting families with drugs and it's affecting um, so many people throughout the community. Um, and I, I would say if you asked me this question probably six months to a year ago, um, I would say the third problem was probably retention of staff. I, I know that we went through a very hard spell of you know losing one after another city administrator for one reason or another and we just lost so much staff and I, I probably some of that was attributed to the pandemic and just the way that culture changed, work culture changed. But I mean, luckily we've come full circle now and the person I started, started with as a parks director is now the city administrator. And I mean, <laughs> I mean, you couldn't ask for a better situation. Uh, Katrina is amazing. And you know, there's so many people that are on staff that are, are so great. And so retention and attraction of, of top tier talent for our city, I think is, is, is an important issue. Great, thank you all. Thank you. Our next question comes from Councilmember Henderson, and the order is Julie Martin, and then Daniel Hobbs, and then Ben Coronado, and then Julie Amon. Can everybody hear me okay? <clears throat> okay. Yes. So uh, my question for <clears throat> Ms. Martin is a little bit of a multi-part question, so I'll repeat it if you need to. <clears throat> Briefly provide your views on climate change. Should the city of Gig Harbor take any actions regarding climate change? If yes, outline three actions you would support the city taking. If no, explain why no action is necessary. I do believe there's climate change. Um, I think most people would believe that. They may differ on why we're having climate change, but I think the data just came out that we're, we had the warmest um, year ever uh, that we've been able to track just last year. So, and we know with that comes some devastating weather actions that are occurring right now, specifically in California. And we've seen a small portion of that just here a few weeks ago. I would say that, yes, we do need to be involved with that. So how we look at our growth management act, how we're looking at the urban forest plan that's coming out, the things that were the kind of businesses that we want to have within Gig Harbor, um, all of those play a part, but it's not just up to us. Uh, as we talked about, there's this line of, yes, 6.13 square miles of Gig Harbor, but just over there is Pierce County, and just over there, right, is the state of Washington and Tacoma, et cetera. And I think it's really a regional approach on how we have to look at this and, uh, and what we want to do and what we can do. I think public-private partnerships are key to this. Um, there is a lot of businesses out there doing some really great things. They are not necessarily the enemy to climate and listening to what they're doing and how they're doing it. And I think working with them collectively would be very beneficial to us. Uh, working with our universities and our students out there are coming up with some exceptional ideas and how we can do things differently that I have never even dreamt about. And they're coming in and that's where you bring that diversity of opinion in to have some better ideas. I don't have all the answers by any stretch of the imagination, but I think there's some really creative things out there that I've been reading about that would be beneficial to the city of Gig Harbor and still make it a very livable city for us. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Hobbs, question is, briefly provide your views on climate change. Should the city of Gig Harbor take any actions regarding climate change? If yes, outline three actions you would support the city taking. If no, explain why no action would be necessary.
I feel like this is a global issue that cannot be resolved particularly. I'm all for what I would like to call microenvironmentalism, clean water, I've mentioned before, clean air. Um, I used to fly into Los Angeles. It was a mess when you flew in there. You couldn't see very far. You fly in on most days now, maybe all days. I don't go there that often. Um, and it's amazingly clean. This country has cleaned up its act in some significant ways. And at the same time, uh, for every step forward, we managed to take two steps back, uh, getting rid of um, natural gas from the federal government level, putting their throats on the, what I consider the energy industry in this country has had a very negative effect on the climate. Um, as long as China is building massive coal plants constantly, you're, you don't have a unified global approach if there is indeed an alarm that needs to happen, which I question as well. So um, I would serve on the, the council. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be there to implement necessarily my own agenda. The city of Gig Harbor is made up of residents and if those residents want to take any particular environmental action, then I would be happy to advise on it and support it. Thank you. Mr. Coronado, sir, would you like me to read the question? I think I got it. You got it? All right, it's okay. yours. So yes, there is climate change. It's, it was more than visible the last couple of weeks. You know, our local businesses were affected. My aunt had a restaurant that was underwater. It was shut down for days while they dried it out because there was water in the lights in the outlets. There's water overflowing our parks. There's, you know, the fact that somebody would say that there's not climate change or something not happening is silly. Um, what that reason might be is their own opinion, but because it's probably many. Um, but I think what the city could do is, is take an assessment at, we have a lot of very expensive waterfront parcels, take an assessment at what our assets there are and how we might look into the future to protect those. Um, we got a lot of parks down there. We just installed a brand new you know, statue or art piece into the park that was nearly overtaken by water, it looked like. Um, you know, I, I had raised those questions as it went in and I, it still went in the same spot and I'm worried for the years to come that, that a very expensive art piece is going to be overtaken by salt water. Um, you know, the, we could also be working with the tribes and other municipalities. The tribes have had a generations long outlook on how to be, you know, sustainable outlook on life. And, you know, I think the city has started to cultivate a very nice relationship with the tribes. And I think that's a very good uh, way to um, really start to look at it and to get them back involved um, and provide them a louder voice in the matter for, um, and also working with the universities and other municipalities, because um, like, like they said, it's a holistic approach. It's more than just us. So I think that's important as well. Um, another action, um, you know, the conservation of, of our trees is probably the biggest one, and, you know, creating that, what we can't, instead of doubling down on the effect, preserving what we can for the trees and, and doing what they can do to help us. Because those, it takes a long time for a tree to get to that point where it's effective in, in what it can do into its, in, Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Ms. Amon. Yes. Would you like me to reread the question? Uh, could you? Please. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Briefly provide your views on climate change. Should the city of Gig Harbor take any actions regarding climate change? If yes, outline three actions you would support the city taking. If no, explain why no action would be necessary. Okay, great. Yes, uh, climate change is real. Uh, we see it. Um, we've just seen it down in the harbor with the rising water, with the king tide and, and uh, the combination of um, rising uh, increased temperatures and water levels. Um, as you know, I've been here the last couple months with my family concerned about uh, tree canopy on 38th 
And I would love to see as we move forward with important infrastructure, making our streets and our and increased pathways safer. But as we do those projects, incorporating um, those concepts with global warming, meaning retaining tree canopy, um, things that I would look to, um, one area is Donkey Creek, um, making sure that we have the Department of Ecology, um, continuing to, to monitor the levels of PCBs in the water that impacts, that goes out into the sound impacts orca and uh, a whole list of marine life. Um, I'd love to see um, as we move forward with the infrastructure and improving Wallachet, um, that overpass and the, the on-ramps to the freeway, I'd like to um, include um, pedestrian paths that enable people to walk to the bus stop, I'd like to see increased buses to get to those cities right now. If you work in Seattle, there's not that many buses. And if we can increase more pedestrian pathways, we might encourage people to leave the car at home and, and commute. Um, and uh, as I mentioned with the 38th project, thinking creatively about um, lighting and um, how that impacts wildlife. And, uh, and, and again, creating a more walkable city where people leave their cars home is important in that whole environmental conversation. So there we go. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, our next question will come from Councilmember Rodenberg. And if you'd like to jot this down, uh, Councilmember, it will be Daniel Hobbs first, Ben Coronado second, Julie Amon, third, and Julie Martin, fourth. I bet, <clears throat> I bet you didn't think you were gonna get to hear from me. Uh, uh, as council members, we often encounter subjects that require us to work together as a group uh, to come up with solutions that are best for all the citizens of Gig Harbor. They're offered in differences of opinion that have to be negotiated to a solution. And no solution must be best for the majority of our citizens. Please describe how you have helped achieve the outcome of the very most complex negotiation that you have ever been involved with. And please be specific. Daniel. Thank you. <clears throat> I wholeheartedly believe in the idea that you would have a group convened to um, to derive a solution. Um, so the working group idea is certainly advantageous. Um, I believe the most complicated thing that I've ever worked on was um, in the city of Seattle, they have um, cold weather shelters. Um, so, uh, there, the city of Seattle would fund them. They would be operated by a social services organization I was the business manager for, and they would be funded to the tune of about 31 or 40 nights per winter. Um, and then they wouldn't, you would have to wait and see what the actual weather conditions that presented themselves were. Um, there were certain levels of precipitation and temperatures that would uh, trigger the opening of one of these um, um, shelters. So um, the activity related to siting the shelter um, was very difficult. It's 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 kind of funny that it makes me think about how easy it is to take a junker RV and park it anywhere in Seattle now. Back then, not quite the same attitude, just for a shelter with people out of sight, out of mind. Wow, I went fast, sorry. I think I know where you're going with it, Phil. Thank you. Ben, would you like me to reread it? 
Sure, please. As council members, we often encounter subjects that require us to work together as a group to come up with solutions that are best for all citizens of Gig Harbor. There are often this differences of opinion that have to be negotiated to a solution that the majority on council can support. Please describe how you helped achieve the outcome of the most complex negotiation you have ever been involved with. Okay. So I think one of the ones that I was involved in was most complex in my opinion was probably the drafting of the shoreline master program for this city specifically. Um, it was a very contentious issue. Um, it involved private property rights, it involved climate change, it involved um, conservation, it involved a lot of people's well-being, and it involved, it, it took a lot of innovative thinking from a lot of very smart people that I was very lucky to be a part of that group. Um, we drafted the shoreline master program to be approved by the city council, the then city council. Um, you know, we, we worked for days and hours and I think it was something like 180 hours on this draft to create this. And it involved so many meetings to, with one another to create this draft that affected so many people within our city that it had to be something that was ultimately the most fair to everybody. And so that was a really hard one to understand for me in that it's gonna affect somebody else a lot worse and it's gonna affect this person. And you know, it's, it's gonna require them to tell them what to do with their property. And that's an influence I had. And that was, that was, that was pretty hard for me to take in and to really grasp. Um, so that was probably one of the most complex ones. But as far as how I feel about it, I feel good. I feel like I could stand behind that. I feel like it's something I worked hard on and that I took a lot of people's well-being into consideration in that would be affected. Thank you. Yeah. Julia Mon, would you like me to reread? Uh, sure. As council members, we are often encounter subjects that require us to work together as a group to come up with solutions that are best for all of the citizens of Gay Harbor. There are often differences of opinion that have to be negotiated to a solution that the majority on council can support. Please describe how you helped achieve the outcome of the most complex negotiation you have ever been involved with. Okay, this is a challenging question because um, I, I feel like it's two part. So some of the most complex um, projects or efforts have been in my volunteer work as a board member with Circle of Friends in Action because we are bringing supplies and programs here in the United States all the way to Uganda. Um, early on, we had to collect supplies and then find a shipping means to get to Uganda. And in theory, that sounds very simple, but it's not. And I would say that um, it, it required reaching out to various businesses, various individuals, because it was multifaceted. We had to first um, uh, retrieve all of the supplies and then determine how to internationally ship something to Africa. Um, and that was probably, and many of the projects dealing in, um, in global development and working when you're working in an inter international place is, is very, very challenging. Um, now, as far as negotiation goes, uh, my background professionally, I've been in production and it's a very, very intense field when you're working in a production. Uh, before the pandemic, I worked on a feature film and it was um, a predominantly uh, Eastern Indian crew. And it was um, learning to um, understand what their needs were and to advocate for them. And when I would go out, um, making sure that I was um, able to achieve their goals um, 
and and then work within their system because their system of productions would be different than the United States production. So that would be the most challenging. Thank you. Julie Martin, would you like me to reread it? No, I think I'm good. Thank you. So uh, I going through my mind, I've got a handful of them, so I need to pick one. So one of them that I will pick is uh, about six, seven years ago, you might have heard that there was a sentencing recalculation issue in which the Department of Corrections had unfortunately let 3,000 incarcerated individuals out sooner than the courts had wanted. At the time, we had two parties, um, Republican and Democrat, and there was a certain group of people who were doing everything they could to investigate what the heck happened here. Fair enough. Then we had people trying to subpoena our staff, very low level staff, who were trying to get the work done and say, we were trying to raise our hand all along that there was an issue here. Working then with the governor's office, who had a very different perspective of get it fixed and get it fixed now, and right, please so. The negotiation started to happen with the legislature about what do we need to do. Everyone thought they had the answer, and I appreciate that everyone wanted to have the answer to this. It was probably the biggest issue before COVID facing the department at the time. The negotiations were, let us do the work to make sure that we can get those people's sentences correct. And if we had to go out and retain them and put them back into incarceration, we could do that safely. The negotiations were, let us put a process, but we need some time to um, change the computer system, which was programmed correctly at the time, but incorrectly after we had gotten some attorney general's opinion. This was something I inherited. In, um, and the negotiations were, I can't have you blaming everybody at this moment. There's a time for accountability, but we have to correct this issue. This is a, one of the most important emergencies that we were facing. All the while, the legislature was getting numerous, you can imagine, thousands of calls from very concerned citizens of Washington state, very concerned calls about those who were incarcerated thinking that they wouldn't get out in time. It was 24-7. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go on with the last question and then additional questions from council, I've had a request for a break. So we will take a five minute break until 2.55. Give you guys a chance to get a glass of water. water. Sorry, I keep turning my mic. Water cooler is right out there. Um, if you have a water bottle to fill up or we have cups somewhere we can find for you. So just let let Josh um, know if you'd like some a cup of water and we'll get you one. Thank you. We'll reconvene at 2.55. Welcome back to the Gig Harbor City Council special meeting of Tuesday, January 10th, 2023. The time is 2.57 p.m. And we will continue on with our questions. The final question, um, formal question, before I take questions from council members, um, not a part of this list is from myself. And so the order will be Ben and then Julie Amin and then Julie Martin and then Daniel Hobbs. So as a member of the council, so Ben, first to you, um, as a member of the, and I apologize if I should be more formal, Mr. Coronado, I only know you as Ben, so. <laughs> um, as a member of the council, you would be expected to participate in government activities outside of the regular city council meetings. Do you have any particular scheduling problems that would preclude your participation? I'm very blessed to have a very flexible schedule. Um, no, not at this time. I... Monday is great, and then I know you guys do a fair amount of midday meetings, and I, I could definitely make that work. Um, as long as you guys still do the hybrid, like Zoom, or you guys strictly in council chambers. Yes. So for clarification about around this question, because we live in a new world now, we are hybrid for all of our meetings. So if you ever need to zoom in, if you can't be here in person, it's completely acceptable to zoom into council meetings. Obviously, preferred to be in person, but if you can't and you need to zoom in. You can always zoom in. And then when I'm talking about um, activities outside, I'm talking about ribbon cutting ceremonies, ungroundbreaking ceremonies, um, other committee meetings, uh, maybe like if you serve on the airport commission or if you serve on, you know, any, any additional committees that aren't specific council committees. Um, actually, we don't have those anymore. So 30, Thursday study sessions. Um, 
those types of activities is what I'm referring to. I, just for so for all of you, the clarification there. Well, like I said, I'm very blessed to have a very flexible schedule. Um, being the owner and operator of my own company. Um, so yeah, and I love those things. It's a great way to get involved in community and meet the community and, and you know rub shoulders with them firsthand. You know, I was at the last one for the um, the carving uh, the artwork dedication. That was great to see some of you down there. And and unfortunately, I'm gonna miss the one this is it this weekend the ungrate groundbreaking or is that yeah, inside. yeah I'm gonna miss that one. So I'm because I do you like can't those. be at them all. <laughs> so um, yeah, I I do look forward if given the opportunity to attend those. Okay, great. Uh, Julie Amon, would you like me to repeat the question? Please. Okay. So as a member of the council, you would be expected to participate in government activities outside of the regular city council meetings. Do you have any particular scheduling problems that would preclude your participation? No, I don't. I'm a freelancer. I'm based at my home and, um, and a lot of the, the like for photo sh shoots, if I have them, are here in Kick Harbor. Um, so it would be easy for me to attend things and I would really look forward to it as well. Thank you. Julie, Martin, any, do we have nothing that's going to preclude me from making those wonderful events. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And Daniel Hobbs. <laughs> it sure got to me fast. Uh, there's a dim light out there at the end of a tunnel. That's my upcoming retirement. Very dim at this point. Um, I potentially could retire a year from April 1st. Um, within the confines of my eight hour day uh, and my adding uh, an hour for commute, my nine hour day, um, I often have flexibility in order to uh, attend things virtually. So that's certainly not out of the question. Um, in my off work hours, um, I have all the flexibility in the world. So. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so at this time, I know there are some council members that had follow-up questions. So if you wanna put your lights on, I will call on you to ask any additional questions that you may have. Council Member Wook. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is a question from Mr. Hobbs. And you've mentioned a couple of uh, social service organizations, I guess, that you've worked with. Can you tell us specifically which social service organizations and what you did there? Happily. Um, <clears throat> I worked for the Salvation Army Seattle Social Services. If I ever pluralize that, it's because in the whole, we operated five separate year-round agencies, if you will. Um, one would be a HUD-like um, housing uh, with uh, services, not just straight housing, but a, a HUD Section 8 um, housing program, two women's domestic violence shelters, um, a general welfare program, and a food bank. Um, when I talked about the emergency shelter I got started on, now my time seems to be unlimited. I should talk faster. I do apologize. Um, <clears throat> When I spoke of that, that was a sort of an ad hoc thing we would do because we had this relationship with the city anyway, city of Seattle in that case, and uh, we were willing and they were supporting. So we ran an emergency shelter um, every year, but it it's that whole concept of a severe winter weather shelter was started while I was there and, and we, ran it six six years that I was there and they probably still run it to this day. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Councilmember Rudenberg. Yeah, this position that you are applying for expires in December. And uh, if you are going to run for that office, I mean, you probably have to file uh, sometime soon to run for it again. So I'm curious, uh, I know it's maybe premature, but uh, would you be willing to run for the office uh, and stand for election at the end of this particular term? Well, uh, and we'll, um, well, I'll just start with yeah. Daniel and go on down. I was just going to preference that um, if you say you are going to run, there are um, state laws that then you have to file 
for office. You so could you say know. you have no objection to running. Yes, I just wanted to make sure people understood the wording. Thank you, Councilmember Likens. I would anticipate that the whole experience would be me willing to run it as early as May. I, I would have no objection to running. I think this is a great experience to um, get some real world experience in this position and, and make sure, confirm that's definitely something I would look forward to. I would have no objection to running. Thank you. This is a conversation at the dinner table at our house, and it's definitely something under consideration. And I would uh, take this experience as a great education in understanding better what the the council does on a more daily basis. So, yes, under consideration. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other lights from council unless someone light isn't working again <laughs> all of a sudden because <laughs> that happens up here sometimes what's that <laughs> no, she uh, mary oh my goodness yeah yes council member denson's light was going on and off and she's not here anymore so we were joking that maybe her ghost had come to join <laughs> us because she misses us so much so Anyway, um, at this point in time, it would be either uh, time to vote if council would like to do that. Council member, oh, Rodenberg, you have your light on. Council member Rodenberg? Oh, okay. Accidental light. Um, so it's up to council where you would like to go from here. So if anyone has uh, any direction, council member Likens. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I would like to go into executive session if that is possible at this time. Is there consensus from council? To, yes? Okay, so we will adjourn to executive session. Do I have to put a time limit on it, Josh? Yes, we need the time limit and the script should be the last item on your agenda there. So um, let's say, how, how long council, maybe you wanna try 15 to start? Yeah, okay, so we'll start with 15 and I'll come in and extend if necessary. So we will now adjourn to an executive session to evaluate the qualifications of a candidate for appointment to elective office per RCW 42.30.110, parentheses one, parentheses H. We will uh, adjourn for 15 minutes and extend if necessary. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back to the Gig Harbor City Council special meeting of Tuesday, January 10th, 2023. The time is 3.25 p.m. And we have a couple, I have clarifying questions. Um, council members have clarifying questions for you, Josh. Um, if you could explain in detail the next portion of the process of the nomination portion and then the actual voting portion. There were some questions um, that we had about how that works. And if you could just expound on maybe what's written here, that would be great. Sure. So the next, this next portion, um, the next step will be for the mayor to open the floor for nominations. Um, once the floor for nominations is opened, any council member can nominate any of the finalists. Um, so a council member can just make a nomination, a second is not required. And once a finalist is nominated, then they are eligible to be voted on um, when the nominations are closed. Um, so once the floor is open for nominations and nominations are received, um, the mayor can close the floor for nominations. And then whoever has been nominated would be eligible to be, eligible to be voted on. Um, at that point, council can deliberate if they want to on the, the people who are nominated. If, if there's discussion you need to have from the dais, you can do that. Um, and, then at that, and then at that point, you'll be ready to vote. And the way you vote is by writing your name on top of a piece of paper and then writing the one candidate that you're voting for. Um, and then I will collect those, those votes and read the, the totals. And then so, I, if, so the if, nominations, can there be more than, can they nominate more than one person or does it, is it one yes, person? Yeah, yes. nominations okay. are open to anyone who's a finalist and it can be as okay. many as council would like to nominate. Okay. Um, so council member Rodenberg. I nominate Joy Martin. Council member Likens. 
I nominate Ben Coronado. Council Member Wook. Uh, we we can't close it. it uh, sorry, I may have skipped over that part, but yes, uh, nominations would be closed by motion of council. So um, that okay. would require a motion, a second, and a vote. So do we have a second to close nominations now? Second. Okay, seconded by council member. I, we, we can still have discussion. So, so Josh, before, if there are council members that wanted to nominate and they didn't get a chance to nominate before the motion and the second, does that mean they can't nominate? So once the motion and second are on the table, then, then that would need to be resolved and then we can go back to nominations. Okay, um, so, so if, we can go back to nominations after we close this first set. Yes, I'll rescind my second. Okay, yeah, I think that the simplest way to do that would just be to withdraw the, the second in the motion if their council student intends to make more nominations. So Council Member Barber res, uh, rescinded her second, but it's up to Council Member Wook if she wants to rescind her motion. If anyone else would like to make a motion, I'm happy to rescind my motion. If anybody else would like to nominate. Sorry. There is another light on. So, okay, so we'll withdraw. The motion has been withdrawn. The second has been withdrawn. Okay, so we'll continue with nominations. Uh, Council Member Henderson. I'd like to nominate Julia Munn. Okay. Council Member Rodenberg. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. Okay, so I don't see any other lights on. So, Council Member Likens. I'd like to uh, close nominations. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So nomination period is closed. So then you have your papers. And as Josh mentioned, uh, write your name at the top. And then you are one uh, person that you'd like to nominate on the bottom. And just put your lights on when you're finished. That'd be great. Okay. Okay. So then we're finished and um, city clerk will come and collect those and you can turn your lights off. Thank you. That's the easiest way for me to know that you guys are all <laughs> good to go. Can I make a statement now? Um, almost, I think. I think we need to wait for the clerk to read the results into the record. Okay. Yes, if you could hold comments until after the results are read. So I'm gonna read the council member's name and then the person they are uh, voting for of the nominees. Uh, council member Barber votes for Julie Martin. Councilmember Henderson votes for Julie Amon. Councilmember Likens votes for Julie Martin. Councilmember Rodenberg votes for Julie Martin. Councilmember Storset votes for Julie Martin. And Councilmember Wook votes for Julie Martin. So Julie Martin has five votes, which is enough for the appointment. Okay. Um, Council Member Wook, now you can make a comment. Thank you. So I, I just want to thank each of you. I want to thank uh, everybody actually who applied for this and for four of you who stood here for questions. It was uh, not really an easy decision because you're all very well qualified. And uh, I think I can um, say, well, I know I can say, I certainly hope that you will, if you're not on a commission, I hope you'll run for commission and apply for a commission because those are great ways to help your community and you can make a difference on a commission. And I'd also like to tell you that there are three seats up for election this year on council. So 
<clears throat> this is only the beginning, not the end. And I hope that you will, uh, I hope you'll consider those options. And most importantly, thank you so much for participating and running. Thank you. Thank you. So now I shall officially declare Julie Martin will be our next council member and you will be sworn into office by the city clerk at the earliest opportunity or no later than our next regularly scheduled city council meeting, which is January 23rd. So you all can work out the schedule there for, for that. And then I believe, do we do like a, an official, more of an official photo op moment at that next council meeting? Yes. Okay. Yes, I think so. Uh, we have a council study session coming up on the 12th, so we can do the uh, formal oath of office there with the swearing in ceremony. Perfect. So that's this Thursday. Okay, so we can do your official swearing in on this Thursday at 3 p.m. Thank you. And on behalf of all of you as council members, I'm sure it was a very difficult decision here as I was listening to I'm going, that was a great answer. That was a great answer, <laughs> right? And so we would have been, I think, well served. So to all of you, um, thank you. And thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. I, I yeah. And please do run for a commission. There are lots of openings coming up. Please, we would love to see your names on there and. Um, or on so, the ballots. Or on the ballots, yes, yes. So at this uh, time, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, meeting adjourned.